So, The House came out on Netflix in January 14 of this year. It is a 2022 British adult stop-motion animated anthology film that's been written by Edna Walsh, who is an Irish playwright. I didn't see any movies of note that are in, in her filmography, so I didn't quite include them. Uh, she appears to be, yeah, writing plays in Ireland and England. Um, essentially, yes, it is, as I said, a different stories that consist into a trilogy spanning different worlds and characters, but all set inside the same house, which is something that I actually wasn't sure about whilst watching the movie, interestingly enough. Um, but it did come out come up during the research. Each three of these uh, stories in the film deals with themes of obsession, madness, wealth, and the pursuit of true happiness. Uh, they have been originally announced as a television miniseries, and I do expect, even though it wasn't mentioned anywhere that I looked, I do expect that it was uh, somewhat inspired by Love, Death, and Robots, seeing as though they are basically short stories, although somewhat longer because each of them takes half an hour. The whole film, of course, has an hour and a half. Um, but, of course, they are animated. They're a little bit creepy, a little bit weird, a little bit trippy at times. So, so there it is. Um, but, yeah, so it is separated into three chapters. Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, very aptly named. And we get a nice little quote at the beginning of each chapter that I quite enjoyed, I must say. I must say. Uh, so, without further ado, we can start with Chapter 1. And heard within... A lie is spun. Very nice uh, little uh, rhyme that I did there. Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually write that. I didn't actually expect to do that. But anyway, chapter one. Just so you have like a little bit of a plot synopsis, what this is about. It's about these human beings that are made of cotton, but you know they're actual real human beings uh, that live in this little house. Um, and they're somewhat frowned upon by the rest of their family who are a little bit more successful. But then a rich architect approaches them, uh, telling them that he will build them a massive mansion. Uh, and all they need to do is sign that they will live there. And they're like, hell yeah, let's fucking do this. We'll be the talk of the town. So they go into that house, but it turns out that it's been somewhat of a of a devil's trick. The house keeps changing every single day. It's these two, this father and mother, Raymond and... I don't remember the mother's name. And then there's Mabel and Isabella uh, as their two small daughters. Daughters. Um, kind of weirded out by my own accent there. Anyway, um, they live in that house. The parents somewhat start changing with the house as well. They become a little bit more greedy. Uh, a little bit more standoffish from their own children and stop taking care of them. So the older sister has to take care of the younger sister. And um, then they are also, the, the architect makes clothes for the parents that uh, look like uh, furniture. And the parents slowly transform into furniture, as you can see on this image, uh, this lovely image. Uh, slowly kind of disintegrating into the house itself. Uh, in the end, the house catches fire. And the two children are forced to escape, and they do indeed escape. Uh, so that's just, you know, so sort of for the plot. Again, spoiler alert, but, I mean, you've been warned. A very interesting start, especially because, as you guys know, I like to go into these movies without any kind of preconceived notions of what it will be. So I expected it fully to be a story of, like, like a horror story of, of a single house that just becomes haunted... Uh, during chapter one, and then it just gets, you know, has more people in this house that somewhat, you know, uh, are down to this, you know, get, get down on this haunting business or get haunted as well. I, I phrased it so weirdly. Sorry, I've been writing like this like the in, the entire day today, so I'm a bit uh, mentally um, jumbled. Yeah, that is that is the phrase that I wanted to use. Alas, it wasn't. It wasn't all creepy, but chapter one was definitely creepy. Um, and as I mean, you can see it on this, on this, on this very image. The character design itself was rather weird. They th there was lots of like close ups, close up shots of these characters of their faces, and you can see like the. I, I think it's cotton actually. I'm not sure about the design now that I think about it, but there are these little you know strings that come up of like you know if you imagine like a cotton ball, right? Um, so it feels very like compact, but also like on the surface, there's like little strings um, that sort of like come out of it. You will see it in the other images as they come up. 
So very kind of realistic in, in a super creepy, but also very interesting, engaging way. Um, when it comes to the environment, however, they really successfully managed to make it quite cozy. Um, this image, for example, you know, the fire is kind of cottony as well. It's not quite visible here, but when there's close-ups of the fire, the fire seems to be made out of cotton as well, uh, which is very interesting. The atmosphere, the voices, or rather the sounds of the ambiance, that's what I'm talking about. Is is, is 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 of this very cozy, very very cool, very engaging kind of atmosphere that immediately pulls you in, um, which is good. I mean, if you have something creepy, to have like an engaging, cozy feeling at the beginning it dr drives you in immediately is quite effective. Kind of reminded me of the lighthouse, because that had that kind of like, um, kind of weirdly melancholic start, but also like somewhat cozy when you think about the whole house that did drive you in at the beginning. I had issue with some of the dialogue, as I usually do. Um, at the beginning, the characterizations seemed quite rushed um, because we were introduced to this family in their little house, and they um, they were they were sort of like immediately kind of pressed by their um, their aunties and their grandma or whatever. Uh, about how the, the how Raymond, the man of the house, is is um, is a little bit of a loser. Uh, how his his father gambled away his his uh, uh, his money and that he was a drunk and that they are not as successful as everybody expected them to to be. And they 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 just like you know they, they just thrown this out on like like a regular family visit. It felt kind of like okay, this is the character we are characterizing them immediately in the situation right now. It felt it felt a bit forced, a little bit forced, but um, it was honestly just this just this part. I didn't I didn't quite have an issue with any of the other dialogue throughout the other chapters. So uh, so yeah, it just felt at the beginning of this one uh, was unnecessarily rushed. But yeah, the, he the, here are the here are the two sisters: Isabella, um, the younger one, the baby, and. Mabel, the older one, that took care of her. But yeah, just not, not, not to be super harsh on the dialogue, there were parts of it that were, that were quite funny. Um, like the way that they talked uh, about... Um, I know, the other characters, for example, about this family. Uh, there was like a joke thrown in there, a little bit of a passive-aggressive, untactful... Uh, joking, like the very kind of British, I would say, uh, that was quite um, uh, quite a, quite funny. And the choice of words, the way that it was written, ne never mind the fact like how direct it was, how unnecessarily direct and unsubtle it was, uh, the words that they chose were just very, very nice. You know, it felt like it came off the tongue quite well. Uh, they called the father a whimperer. Which was, a, which is a word that I haven't heard in a long time. A whimper, as in a man who whimpers or a person who whimpers. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite funny, or quite entertaining, quite quite good, quite well written that part. <sighs> Here's my thoughts uh, of the chapter that I had like immediately as as of watching, right? Like, whilst I was watching this. Because Raymond sort of, you know, was drunk and outside of his outside of his hut, and he was approached by this architect uh, to sign this deal, and then his reaction to the deal when he realized he made it, uh, as, you know, he woke up from a drunken stupor the next morning, uh, it, it, it very kind of pointed to this biblical greed. Um, and when I say biblical, I mean... And, you know, I don't want to step on any toes here, but the way, like, some of the stories from the Bible that are, that are supposed to be, like, educational about, like, greed or about pride, stuff like that, it very often feels to me that at, like, the first kind of shallow, uh, or not, maybe not shallow, but, like, the first thing that you think about it is that the characters that are being punished did something that is pragmatically or practically quite understandable and, like, a regular human reaction to things. 
Um, but of course, it, it is there to kind of, and, and then there is a, a massive overreaction and overcorrection of this of this sin that they have committed by the story, right? Uh, it feels like almost nonsensical. That's, I think, why many people have problems with Christianity or belief in, in general. Um, so, you know, like, for, for example, here, right? Uh, they, they were kind of shown as greedy for wanting to live in a bigger house. But realistically, uh, they lived in a small, small house uh, with two children and not a lot of money. And they were offered to live in a mansion that was fully serviced along with 24-7 free meals for free. And at that point, it's difficult to blame them. Um, yet, they were punished for this very decision. Now, the movie, or rather the chapter, does well in in uh, in not really showing how, how ridiculous this is by having the reaction of the parents to the fact that they will be living in this house be quite, um, quite interestingly written, quite well written, in order to show that it is for greed rather than for wanting to take care of their children better. Um, because their immediate reaction upon learning that they can live in this mansion is like, uh, you know, think of it, we will be the talk of the town and everybody will respect us now and, and we will be, you know, we, we will be the envy of everybody. So it is very much in this reaction, um, or their, their reaction for taking the house or their rationalization for taking the house and abandoning their old one. But... Their actions of taking the bigger house are quite understandable. So that's what I mean when I say biblical. That's kind of like what I feel. There's one particular story, which I don't know the name of in English because I've only read the Bible in Czech. Uh, in Czech, it's Marnotratný syn. Uh, something about a son, like a, like a prideful son or something like that. It's one of the stories of the New Testament. Essentially, a story about two brothers and a father. Uh, one brother taking off out into the world to find, you know, uh, fortune somewhere else, and the other son uh, staying with the father, helping him with the farm, taking care of him when he was ill and everything like that. And then the first son returns back, and the father sort of tells him, I'm glad that you're back. Uh, you, you own half of the farm along with your brother. And the other brother is like, well, listen, this isn't, this isn't really fair. I mean, I've been taking care of you this whole time. This guy just fucking up and left. And the father told him, don't be prideful, son, but for you are both my sons. And the fact that he returned back means that he's just as much a son to me as you are. Um, so, you know, like, I, I kind of un I understand the message that the story is pushing. But again, the fact that he was forgiven imme immediately is somewhat strange uh, for me to, to fathom. Even more so in this story, the overcorrection that happened in this in this story. Um, but later on, I kind of came back to the story to to re-examine what I thought about it, my kind of interpretation, um, especially after seeing the other chapters, because I believe that every chapter will be about some kind of cardinal sin, uh, somewhat more biblical. And maybe the reason why I was thinking about the Bible is because this appears to take place in like the 18th century. Uh, judging by the clothes and, and the technology. Um, but uh, when I saw the other chapters, it felt that it's, it's more about... Um, it's more about, again, as I said in, in the introduction, the pursuit, pursuit of true happiness, perhaps, you know, mental um, well-being and, and all of that. So realistically, even though greed was explored the most, in this story. Uh, I think rather than looking at it biblically, the story wanted for us to realize what it's like to, you know, have extreme uh, unhealthy passion or obsession with something um, and just abandoning our true nature, for example, or abandoning our, um, our past or what makes us us. Um, because, you know, in, in, in the case of the parents, it was quite visibly shown through them starting to neglect their children. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> mm. 
quite quite entertaining indeed. So overall, I did enjoy the chapter. I think I I would say almost I don't know. I don't know if I enjoyed chapter one or chapter three more. I mean, I, I will tell you all about like what I enjoyed the most at the at the end um, of of the review, but. Overall, the chapter was quite interesting in, 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 in the vibe that it created because it had some kind of a horror vibe a little bit to it as well. Uh, it was very macabre happening at night, uh, mostly um, rather creepy as well, as you can see, and even like almost biblical in, in, this, in the sense that the story progressed. I, I still kind of feel it even though I realized that, that was probably not what the story was going for, but hey, that's just, you know, that's just how I feel. It did well to explore obsession and greed in, like, very nice details. That's what this, that's what this movie does well. And, um, so for example, the parents, when they were in, in this massive dining hall of their new mansion, there were the, the mother was completely transfixed by a sewing machine because she she is revealed at the beginning of the chapter to have sewn all the clothes for all the members of the family uh, with you know just the hand knitting essentially. Um, but then when she saw sees a sewing machine, saws a seeing machine, um, she you know she's completely transfixed. And if you look at the character model over there to the left, not the real person on the right, obviously. Uh, you can see that it's very easy to make these characters look like they're transfixed on something, because they have literal googly eyes. Like these are they are their eyes. Their eyes are googly eyes. Okay, uh, but but it is yeah. It's mostly in the movement of the eyebrows that that uh, like different expressions are sort of given. Um, you know, sort of making make make make, make us imagine. Um, what they're feeling, or whether they're transfixed or not, like stuff like that. Um, and they did it quite well with the mother being transfixed on the sewing machine and the father being transfixed on the electrical lighting uh, on in the dining hall, um, because he was shown at the beginning to be uh, somewhat interested in the family fire, you know, him being the the, the man of the house or whatever. And back in back in those days, uh, he would be somewhat charged with keeping the fire going. Uh, I assume. Um, I don't know, I'm not completely caught up in my 18th century patri patriarchal society rules, but that's that's what I that's that's why I imagine that was there. Uh, so it was seen as like, you know, these huge upgrades for both of these people in their lives, in, in sort of what, what makes them them, makes them interested. This this whole shiny and new vibe um, made them so transfixed and so passionate about this new place that they completely forgot about their real identity, about what really matters in the case of these small children. So yeah, I said overall, but I didn't quite conclude it. Very, um, very kind of creepy and, and, and you, I don't know, some people could find it scary, I suppose. Um, maybe a little bit of an overcorrection to an initial sin, but the story itself works, and despite some rushed dialogue, I enjoyed it quite, quite a lot. Mm. Any questions you might have, by the way, I, I, I do think... Have you guys seen it, Gautier Shadow? Have you guys seen it? I assume that you probably have not, uh, but even if you haven't, then of course I'm always, always open to... Any questions that you might have, um, you know, to liven the debate, liven the discussions. What in it would I watch it with? Ah, yes, I, I, I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting that, um, that the internet is quite bad where you are. That is That is quite unfortunate indeed. Um, I did I did not have the opportunity this week. Um, yeah, I mean, completely understandable, mate. Like, I've, I've given you, like, two days' notice with this review plan. That's completely on me. So, no worries. No worries there. But, hey, the next movie we're reviewing is, like, is yours, right? Yeah, yeah. Next movie is Dread. By the way, since I really had, like, very little time 
to show to to check out um, anything to to make the review properly or anything. I just chucked in uh, stuff that sounded well and I haven't seen yet. Um, so I have no idea. Like I don't even know the genre of this movie. I like I have no idea what that will be. It's gonna be interesting. I've seen it several times. Okay, another of Cotier's favorite. I hope that I won't have to break his heart then. Um, but hey, like the past several movies that you've, you've you've requested were quite good, right? Yeah, Airplane. Before that, it was The Northman. Uh, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. So that was the, the the last time where I where I severely disagreed with you. Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. So yeah. <clears throat> Do to be quite interesting. <laughs> hey, it's always it's always uh, a 50-50 almost whether I like a movie or not. I mean, if you sh if you suggest like a um, like a smart artsy movie, I suppose that I won't you know uh, I I I won't have any recourse but to but to praise it praise it but. I'm glad that you guys suggest regular movies and not fucking artsy movies. I don't think I'd be able to keep that up every week. I do need to sh shit on things from time to time, you see. Indeed. Okay. Let me see if I can do this. Oh. I want to move on to the next chapter. I set everything up with the images like I did for Love, Death and Robots, but it didn't quite time itself well. There we are. Oh my lord. Seriously? Well, I fucked it up now, didn't I? Okay, well, the slideshow is a little bit fucked. I'll need to, I'll need to control this manually. Um... <laughs> But it's fine. It's fine. I, I, I'm, I'm good at improvising. There we are. Chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2's nice little quote was, Then lost is truth that can't be won. I'll remind you of the, ch of the, of the, of the um, quote from chapter 1, right? Chapter 1 was, And heard within a lie is spun. Chapter 2 says, Then lost is truth that can't be won. Uh, that is something that I completely forgot to research because I'm quite certain that this is a poem that I've read at some point before in my life and I can't remember where it's from, but the chapter names or the more than the chapter, ra rather it's the quotes of these chapters, um, they, 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 they come from something. I don't think they've written them. I think that they, they come from a poem. You know what? Researching it right now. Um, and heard within Elias Spun. Actually, they might have written it. That, yeah, they might have actually written that. Wow. That is pretty fucking impressive, if you think about it. It's a very good poem. I mean, it's not a full poem, but... It feels like it. Yeah. So, no, it is, it is, it is actually a, um... A thing. They did actually write it. But never mind that. We're moving on to the chapter in the second chapter, chapter two. It's um it's a chapter about mice. So apparently this is the same house uh, that that it that you know was built in chapter one. I just really didn't expect it because it was literally in the middle of a English town. Um, like right, like kind of, kind of like almost like center. You know, it felt like like the center. Maybe not 
quite the center, but close to the center. That's why it seemed weird, because it was literally out of out in the middle of nowhere in chapter one. So it seemed strange for a city to be built around it. Um, but yes, apparently, you know, the, it, it says that, or the, the, the official, you know, filmmakers say that this is the same house, so whatever, it's the same house, okay? Anyway. The plot for this one, uh, we are moving away from cotton human beings. We are now uh, in in the company of anthropomorphic mice. Uh, every um, you know, every anthropomorphic character and anthropomorphic, if you don't know what that means, is essentially um, a non-human uh, character uh, or non-human either animal or object that behaves like human beings. They are usually seen in fables. Um, you know, animations, anything essentially that behaves like a human that has no business behaving like a human. Okay, that's a simple explanation. So anyway, uh, this is a story about this mouse in particular. Uh, his name... His name I forgot. Let me, let me, let me look it up for you. I searched up the house characters and it found house MD. Oh, the, I, I know why I forgot it, because he doesn't have a name. He's just called the developer. The developer. The, the developer. Anyway. Yes, so he's the developer. And he devil, he's, uh, he's working sort of on this house that he, you know, claims in his numerous phone calls to his girlfriend uh, and the bank that, you know, he put all his life savings into, into sort of making it renovated, into making it very good and to, to you know, sell it at a profit. Um, so, so, you know, it's a huge deal for him. And you kind of start with him developing the house, reconstructing and, and kind of worrying about things. Um, the movie is showing us that he's, you know, on the hook with the bank uh, for putting all the money into it. And he's like, you know, he's, 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 he's um, rather stressed, um, but, but he's also, you know, He's quite personable as well for a mouse. For a mouse, definitely, uh, he is quite personable, and we see like, sort of like his journey of of working on the house and worry worrying about the upcoming open house where potential buyers will come in and uh, and assess the place and see if they want to buy it or not. Um, though they, uh, you know. The, 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 the issue, however, arises when he realizes that the house is infested with cockroaches. He first tries to, or rather, some kind of... Uh, they are called fur bugs in this, um, in this chapter, right? And first, he tries to, like, seal them off in the walls and stuff. Like, just kind of, like, push them, push them away, sort of, like, block them. Um, and, you know, not worry about them too much. Uh, and then there is this open house, and it's a little bit of a fiasco. Uh, lots of people are like, you know, not sure about the place. They're not sure, sure about his like erratic uh, personality. He tries to be as personable as possible, as this nice suit and everything, and he's always like trying, or always like fretting like a mouse uh, around. And um, uh, realistically, nobody nobody's really going for it. Um, but then he discovers at this open house two mice. Um, that, you know, again, anthropomorphic mice, that say that they are very interested in the house. And they are, I think they're supposed to be like two older ladies uh, that uh, appear to be quite uh, sophisticated. So he's excited, like, okay, finally I have some buyers, awesome, huge weight is lifted. Um, but then they kind of like, they, they kind of like start, you know, looking around and they end up in the, in the, in the bedroom. And they just set up to go to bed and he's like oh um well are you this is like a open house blah, blah. and they're like oh we love it we you know this is this is awesome we're really interested in buying which is enough to shut him up for the first three times but then as he re slowly starts realizing that these two mice have essentially moved in uh they uh like he he starts kind of you know worrying about this like obviously this is fucked up like they they, they can't uh like they won't ever buy the place. They're they're just they're just here to just move in and stay in. Uh, they're not actually actually interested. At this point, I also notice that these two mice that are there uh, and you know being a nuisance are 
a completely different shape to all the other mice in the in this whole in this whole chapter because all the mice have the same character model as this one the same height the same shape the same everything uh but yeah so as you can see all all the mice even though they're like different different breeds of mice i suppose they're they are the same the same characters uh but uh these two as you can see over there uh they are very different one is quite wide and a little bit of a bowl and the other one is quite long and thinking about that uh makes me you know made, made me realize that the infestation that he was trying to take care of was not only the fur bugs but also like these larvae that were quite long and then it clicked these two mice are exactly the same shape as the two uh vermin the fur bugs and the larvae uh that you know he tried to first just just you know put them aside glue them into the walls and stuff and then try to get rid of with um um uh, with poison unsuccessfully of course um but then uh, as they as, as they moved in, you know, more of their family, these two guys that moved in, these two ladies, uh, they were all of the same shapes as well. And then it began began clicking quite, uh, like, even more so. So realistically, the film showed us, or the chapter showed us, infestation of, like, the regular proportion, and then an infestation of, like, this strange new kind of human proportion. Um... After which, of course, the, the, our character started somewhat unraveling. Uh, one, you know, he wanted to call the police, or he called the police, rather he was stressed, the police showed up. But the police told him that he needs to stop calling his dentist and, uh, you know, calling him darling and sweetie. We realize uh, at that point that this girlfriend that he's been calling throughout, telling her that, you know, they will buy the house and everything will be fine, that they will fly to Maldives and all that. He actually said that. Um... That it was actually his dentist, so he, you know, is suffering from some kind of delusions uh, as well. Um, he kind of, kind of collapses after after all of this, after trying to get rid of these people, after having this stress, goes to the hospital, and these guys, you know, come for him and tell him, "Hey, you have to go back home." They go back home, and uh, the whole situation unravels. All. All the all the uh, family friends of these two guys, um, along with this guy, the developer, start behaving like actual like um, actual vermin. But this guy actually starts behaving like a mouse, like a, like an actual mouse. You know, he's like running around, and the way that like his his body moves is no longer human, but now it's like fully mouse-like, and uh, he doesn't talk. He's just a mouse. And these guys eat up everything in the house. They eat the couches. They they shit all over the place. Uh, they they wriggle around just like war worms would. And um, and it, it's this whole you know bizarre look on this entire house that essentially everything uh, where everything kind of collapses. And that was the point where I where I started reconsidering chapter one. Um, because it's it was very clearly about mental health and mental illness. It was the infestation of um, of the house, uh, his own mind, and perhaps by extension, the infestation of the house was somewhat an infestation of his own mind, um, and. Uh, Yeah, and and uh, and this kind of revealed that everything kind of you know fell apart essentially. I wasn't sure exactly the purpose of revealing that this girl girlfriend that he was calling this whole time uh, and calling her darling and sweetie was actually his dentist, um, other than like showing that he had some kind of mental Ill issues before uh, all of this has been happening, or perhaps to kind of tie it together. Uh, I guess, but it was a, an interesting, like, r rather a strange choice, but then again, this is a very strange film. Um, but yeah, it kind of, it kind of immediately um, took me away from the idea that this is going to be a horror anthology, and instead uh, I realized that this is more of a analogy kind of anthology. 
uh, about a single house, um, about the mind, about the human mind, and about uh, uh, human qualities, about our failures, and about what we strive for, our ambitions, and perhaps the dark side of the human mind, and and, and the dark side of um, of our ideals, about family, about sense of self, and about the you know the passion for true happiness and and uh, and all of that. Um, but the way that the movie came 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 around to it was quite interesting because in this chapter, in the first chapter, it was quite horror esque and almost biblical, uh, whilst in this one it was is progressively more trippy and strange, and like so. So if the first one was creepy, this one was like bizarre. That's how I would describe it, because far removed from all the vermin shit, right? There was also a scene. Yes, I knew it was here. There was also a scene where uh, the developer tried to show off how the house is all modern, right? And he, on on his phone, he showed how like everything, how how he can change the lights and change the music. And then his, and then he dropped his phone. His phone cracked, uh, and it resulted in the whole house flickering in in different colors, uh, like really quickly. Uh, and and the music kind of getting stuck in in this perpetual you know like vibrating almost like EDM kind of vibe, uh, and there was this hugely long shot on this one character. Um, this is sort of when when the character revealed their interest in the house, uh, one of the ones that, that moved in. Um, this long shot of of the lights flickering and kind of reflecting from their black eyes as the music just kept getting crazier and crazier, and I was like looking at this like, what, what am I watching? Like, what is this? Like, I, I, I thought I was watching a horror movie or something. Uh, so it 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 went to to like really bizarre heights, which was very um, very well done to underline what this story was mostly about, which, in my opinion, was, of course, uh, mental m mental health uh, and some kind of a mental balance between things. Um, and illness and issues and and uh, disorders uh, that, um, that this mouse suffered, rather. Not this mouse, but like the analogy, like what would we suffer from, what, what our issues are. I did consider briefly that it was just about uh, a house infestation and trying to show it from two different ways, how like uh, these anthropomorphic mice and by extension human beings can also be like an infestation, but then I realized it's, it's, it goes deeper than that. But I mean, hey, it's just my opinion. You can check it out for yourself and let me know what you think. I mean, most of you can't, most of you can, Shadow probably can't, but yeah, that's uh... That's that. But yeah, this uh, shot, which is probably midway through the chapter when he tries to get rid of the infestation before the open house, is kind of endemic, I believe, of um, what, this, what this chapter uh, tried to tell us. Um, because he lies down kind of exhausted because he's getting rid of, this, uh, of, of these bugs. And you can see the shapes, right? You can see the bugs and the larvae, um, which are the same shapes as, as these guys. This is the advantage of, of being able to control this manually, by the way. So yeah, as you, like if you look at these shapes, they they are very cleverly mir mirroring the shapes of this of, of these two types of vermin that are in the house. Um, but they are called uh, fur bugs, and he tried to get rid of them with this with this spray, essentially, or or this or this powdered poison. Um, but it really exhausted him and he fell down on the ground after, you know, crazily trying to get rid of them with the vacuum and, and this and this and this powder. But rather than him collapse, collapsing from exhaustion, I, I sort of saw it as him harming himself. Because if they are fur bugs, and I think the name was chosen very much on purpose, um, this this poison would probably harm him as well, right? Seeing as he is made of fur too. Um, and essentially, I mean, mouse slash rat using poison to kill vermin in the house is very interesting, uh, very interesting kind of 
uh, idea there because uh, it's it's almost as if he is trying to get rid of vermin whilst being vermin himself at least you know considered by us like kind of a human perspective uh, i think they chose a mouse and they chose this poison and they chose them to call them fur bucks for a reason because he's trying he's you could see this as him being self-destructive um, and getting rid of sort of his demons in the most destructive way possible um, it could be seen as uh, either uh, you know regular human uh, in regular human idea of uh, just trying to you know get away from a situation in the worst possible way um, or it can be seen as an actual harmful mental illness uh, those are the two ideas that I have for this chapter um, but there are also the there are also the um, the connecting uh, themes that this has the chapter two has with chapter one, which are um, the the denial of some kind of an issue and um, mental mental changes uh, or mental transformation and an incessant um, need um or incessant rather obsession of um on, on a house which of course can signify many things either the human mind or um this 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 uh inability to move away from a goal or to to chase sort of what we believe to be happiness with some kind of obsessive behavior uh, not knowing when to let go because just as much as this mouse not wanting to give up on this house and doing everything and pouring all of its um, or pull, 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 pulling all of its resources into this house um, trying to sell it and all that and being super erratic so did the parents in chapter one when uh, Mabel told them, "Hey, listen, like you should take care of your daughter." Essentially, um, she like we, she's 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 hungry, uh, and also I hate this house. Let's go back to our old house. And they got mad at her for that, and um, they they you know they they refused to take care of them. So yeah, denial and blinding desire. Again with the rhymes, somewhat. Um, to pursue something that perhaps is not worth pursuing. And we move to chapter 3. Listen again and seek seek the sun. Uh, a little bit of a voice break. I'm not used to talking for 15 minutes straight. Uh, except for Fridays, of course. So yeah, chapter one, and heard within, a lie is spun. Chapter two, then lost is truth that can't be won. And chapter three, listen again and seek the sun. We will read it again at the end when I give you more of a comprehensive conclusion that I have from these through three stories. They were actually pretty good. But let me give you first the plot outline of this um of this chapter, of chapter three. Um, so apparently we're still in the same house, but um, now we are with cats. And also this house is now on an island in the middle of pretty much the ocean because the flooding has came, has come, sorry. And uh, although not confirmed in the chapter, I believe that this is post-apocalyptic Earth or post-apocalyptic world. Um, because we had something from pretty much the 18th century, then we had something from nowadays, and now we have something that's most likely in the future, even though, again, not confirmed, um, that shows the world being uh, destroyed by the flood. Uh, also, one other reason why I think that, you know, time is relevant is because that at the beginning of every chapter, there is a clock, um, and there's a little image of a clock. In chapter one, that clock is an old grandfather clock. In chapter two, it's a digital alarm clock. And in chapter three, it is a sundial, um, which, of course, is relevant to the name of the chapter, Listen Again and Seek the Sun. Um, and also the fact that, you know, post-apocalypse can't really, you know, you have to get by with, with, with what you got. 
Um, but that is something that our main protagonist isn't willing to accept. This is Rosa, and her entire mission throughout this chapter is to renovate her house. It is clear from the first shot, again, as you can see, that this is some kind of post-apocalyptic Earth and or world, and that like there's not many people. There's just Rosa, and then there's her two tenants, Penelope and Elias. Both cats as well, of course. This is the world of cats. Um, and it, this is all about uh, her being the only pragmatic person, the only pragmatic cat in this whole house. Because she wants to renovate, she wants to get in new tenants uh, so they can get more money to fix all the issues. You know, the, the two tenants are complaining that the water is brown and if something can be done with that. And she's irate and angry with both of them um, that they can't pay rent. Elias constantly pays her with fish that he catches. And um, Penelope uh, pays her with, um, with minerals because she's an esoteric cat, interestingly, interestingly enough. Um, so they are both shown as these kind of like, you know, impractical, non-pragmatic cats at all times while she's sort of in denial and trying to renovate her house. As Stefano just commented, you seem to have dealt with some kind of cat, cat obsession recently. No, Stefano, I assure you that this is merely a coincidence that I happen to watch a, uh, a film that has cats as protagonist and that Stray was a trending game, okay? I still... Prefer dogs. Don't worry, Stefano. I'm still a dog person. But um, a very astute observation, my friend. Very astute indeed. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, you know, we, we sort of side with our protagonist naturally. Because, you know, they should pay rent. I mean, it's her house. It's 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 her project. She she shows that, that she's... Uh, um, that she's she loves this house and that she has this view of, of the house becoming more you know beautiful and and that she's gonna make more memories in there and everything like that um and then Penelope's you know old boyfriend or something arrives who which is an even more esoteric cat very like in connection with nature and everything his name is cosmos by the way and he's very unconcerned with um, material things, uh, which uh, drives um, which drives Rosa, our protagonist, crazy. Uh, but then uh, he is revealed to be a very handy handyman, which immediately makes her excited. Um, so you know they decide, hey, let's start working on this and this and this. But instead of helping her on the house, uh, Cosmos uh, dismantles parts of the floorboards to make a boat for Elias, because Elias wants to leave. Um, Rosa is, of course, angry that her house is being vandalized, but then she is also very sad because Elias leaves without telling her goodbye. Uh, we then slowly, you know, through Penelope, even though she's very esoteric and also doesn't really do kind of like regular earthly conversations talk about like and talks about like chakras and stuff like that um we realize through her trying to reach out to rosa that it's actually rosa that's being the, mo the most impractical cat in the house uh because you know she's been requiring rent of her tenants and trying to renovate her house while the world is still flooding it is revealed it is like at, at, at one point penelope just can't keep up the the charade seemingly any longer and tells her listen rosa um tomorrow there will be water in the house and uh rosa just does doesn't react to it and keeps being angry about her house being vandalized and this sort of like keeps on uh rosa just being angry penelope and like, trying to reach out to her and and having like last dinner with her and um then cosmos telling telling rosa that that uh, he made her a lever at the, at the front of the house that she can pull when she's ready to emancipate herself and rosa just obviously hates this because she's a very pragmatic and practical person and uh, she hates the fact that these guys partly vandalized her house but then they both leave on their boats as well and the mist uh, arrives uh, whilst the flooding continues and she's sort of like she's she gets lost in this mist 
and 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 sees how uh, all of her friends are leaving her, how she's now alone. She sees some of, like her future possibly of her crying in a corner. It's it's very like you know it's, it's very melancholic, um, very anxiety inducing uh, very, uh, scenes in in this mist. But then she finally realizes, uh, oh my god, I'm 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 in a flood. Uh, she you know she screams at uh, at uh, Cosmos and. Um, and Penelope that are sailing away, you know, like, hey guys, please, uh, you know, uh, this, help me. And they're like, come, uh, come with us, Rosa, come with us, you can do it. And she's like, well, I can't do it, like, you know, I'm on this island. But then she remembers, she pulls the lever, and the house transforms into a giant boat, and she boats towards her friends. Elias shows up, and it's kind of happily ever after as they sail into the sunset. Surprising, um, because I did believe that um, she will die for her sins of not being able to let go, uh, as sort of the parents in Chapter 1 did, by the way. Um, but it also very clearly communicated the message, whether she lived or died, um, of trying to hold on to something that's already gone. And that again does not necessarily have to be a house it's um it's more the idea of of what gives us happiness and what uh, what what is what, rather what is ne necessary for our happiness i think the easiest like metaphor or easiest analogy to draw to this are relationships um i mean we we all somewhat understand whether from our own experience or from experience of our friends that um, many times, you know, that people often wind up in toxic relationships that, uh, that they are unable to leave because uh, they either invested so much into them, so that's a sunk cost fallacy uh, in psychology, um, and they want to believe that it will work eventually. So, you know, they've been with that person for a year and a half and it worked somehow, and, and now after a year and a half, why would I leave for issues that were there at the beginning? Or because it turned toxic over time you know the honeymoon phase kind of faded the person became more and more the kind of person that they always were but try to hide in front of the other person um either way it doesn't matter it, now it's a toxic relationship and whether you put put cost into it or whether you believe uh, foolishly that it can still work which is probably the case for this analogy in, in this particular chapter you need to realize that you're actually unhappy that this is futile and that you need to move on and again it doesn't have to be a relationship it can be a career or a particular career move i myself had somewhat of this situation although i did not hold on actually but i was perhaps in a danger of the situation because when i studied psychology forensic psychology in manchester which i believe for like five six years that that would be my life for the rest of my life uh, and and I, I, I realized over there, um, whilst I was studying this forensic psychology, that I actually don't enjoy this. Um, I either could stay with this sinking house of studying forensic psychology or go forth into the unknown and return back home without any idea on what to do. And I chose the latter. And I was, you know, I was very decisive because... I am the kind of person that, for better or for worse, follows their instincts, um, and uh, and so so I myself did not happen to be in this particular situation, but I was very near to it. And if I was perhaps of a perhaps a different person, perhaps a person that was a little bit more attached or a little bit more conservative in the way that I live my life. I would not be able to do that decision and I would be stuck stuck just as Rosa was stuck. Um, but yeah, like it, it was very clearly and very well shown, this thing that I'm describing to you now, and it was very well shown in this movie, and it just kind of breathed through it, you know. There was this there was a Rosa's denial of of uh, of the fully exposed truth that the flooding is going to destroy her house once Elias tells her that the water is reaching the house. It was actually to Elias, not Penelope, sorry. And uh, then her unwillingness to... Um, th th then sort of showing that Rosa's tenants' unwillingness to pay with money but still, you know, supplying rent of some kind 
uh, is is some kind of like another way they sh uh, th 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 they show appreciation for her, trying to help her out of this out of this tough spot, uh, and and them kind of like trying to drag them drag her away from this futile uh, futile act of trying to save an unsavable house. You know, there were all these like leading questions in in like three or four separate conversations that Rosa had with Penelope um, that aimed to kind of draw closer and closer into Rosa's Rosa's heart. This is Penelope, by the way. But yeah, it was the house. Um, the house, as the movie, as the name of this movie. Um, that in this particular chapter was a simile of something that um, that cannot be cannot be escaped or, or rather uh, should be escaped, but you yourself cannot escape um, through sheer stubbornness and inability to move on. And again, we have that denial there. In here, the denial is the strongest. I believe that if without this chapter, the themes would not be as clear. So even the even despite the fact that this is an uh, this is supposed to be like an anthology, as in uh, a series of uh, stories that uh, do not you know have the same uh, that, that that work separately, um, you really do need to see all three together to understand what um, you know what's going on. I feel to to really drive those themes, those themes gone uh, home, and um, together with that, chapter three has a very beautiful ending uh, of Rosa finally accepting to move on from the house, uh, letting it behind her, which is something that um, most of the characters from chapter two and chapter one couldn't do, um, and you know finally realizing that staying in, staying in denial about her house. Or relationship or job or whatever or career path uh, will make her make her lose it yeah this these are the these are the floorboards this is a very good shot um, but yeah I mean we've already kind of started talking about it so we might as well move on to kind of the concluding factor or the, the conclusion rather of all these three chapters together as I said, it's a lot about denial, and it's a lot about uh, mental health, and it's about a pursuit of happiness, um, and uh, it's 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 an exploration of human psyche and our passions and our pursuits and uh, what what holds us back, what drives us forward, um, and it. it it looks at these things through different, like three different lenses, uh, essentially talking about the same thing, but looking at them from different perspectives, and perhaps even like different times. Because chapter one is this house that has drawn in people so powerfully that they neglected their children. Uh, chapter two attempts to kind of refurbish this house. Um, and, and this incessant need to have it perfect, so much so that it destroys your own mind and infests your own mind with disorders and illnesses, and perhaps it doesn't have to be like an actual illness, a uh, mental illness, but perhaps it's more like the nagging feelings, the melancholy, the depressions, like all of that uh, together that kind of, you know, really takes it out of you, really destroy you in the end. Uh, or it's the final denial of all the issues that that um, that are there um, with with this particular choice. But at the same time, the movie isn't cynical in, um, and perhaps this is the reason why Rosa didn't die. Because if she had just died there, then the message of the movie would be: uh, pursuing anything is terrible. It'll just consume you, and you will die. Because Rosa, in the end, did escape her house, or, you know, she made it into a boat, but essentially she escaped it, okay? And she moved on um, with her house uh, towards her friends, towards the horizon, looking for, looking for new things. 
Um, and the fact that she took the house actually makes me think that the house it actually makes me want to go back to my previous interpretation that the house is actually the human mind. Um, chapter two really made me think that. And I think chapter three kind of works in the same way as well. Because chapter two is, is the mind of a conservative man or conservative woman or conservative person that just stays the same and you just want to like make minor tweaks when the whole ship's fucking going down. Um, and chapter two is the mind that's fully infested with things but trying to look good, trying to look good outwardly when you have deep-seated issues that you don't want to deal with. And chapter one is being preoccupied with yourself so much that you can't, um, that, you, that you can't focus on things that actually matter, you know? Um, so it would be like ego, um, denial of, of personal issues, and three is like denial of, of, of perhaps like external issues. Like these, it's difficult to put into words, but it's a very, very effective movie in exploring all all of these perspectives and all of these sort of times when the human mind perhaps fails us in the most important thing um, or in what we deem to be the most important thing in the, in the uh, eternal pursuit of happiness. And even though it's very weird, creepy and just bizarre at times, and it isn't very like super artsy, the dialogue isn't like super smart or anything, when you think about this movie for a little bit longer than it takes to watch it, and I did, then it um, then it really does, you know, make sense in many ways, and it can actually teach you something, and it can make you self-reflect, um, which ultimately is what I always say is the sign of good cinema or good art in general, art that makes you self-reflect, think about your own life and think about um, how things work, how things are in the world, is a movie that is excellent. And even though I really did not expect to say this when I finished watching this movie, because it didn't feel super special when I watched it, it felt like something that I could watch for, you know, like just chill out in the afternoon, it really did make me think. And to make a movie that's like easy, so easily digestible, and at the same time has the capability of making you think, is truly masterful and as a result i think that the movie is truly masterful you know it has 97 percent uh, aggregate on rotten tomatoes from 29 critics mostly positive reviews um and yeah mo an average rating of 7.4 the website's consensus reads whether you're a fan of stop motion animation or just looking for something deeply alluringly weird the house will feel like home and Metacritic also gives it 71 out of 100, which I think it deserves more. Uh, I generally do. I think it would be like 8.5 to 9, uh, realistically, um, from my point of view. So yeah, three very different perspectives and characters and vibes on all of this pursuit of happiness that we've been talking about. Um, very worth... Very worth giving the watch over the weekend or whenever you return to civilized world and you have good enough internet um, For sure for all of you guys that are watching And yeah, that's that's what I think and I hope that uh, I Hope that uh, you enjoy the review if you have any questions, of course hit me with